Hello, and welcome once again to CS441-541 Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well in this difficult time. Today, I want to talk about an example of the stuff I talked about in the previous lecture. I want to talk about a kind of puzzle called the sliding tile puzzle, which is a puzzle that introductory AI classes have been playing with for at least 30 years, because that's when I took it. It's a very popular example of some of the things that come up in combinatorial and state space search, and it's kind of fun. So let's take a look at some and see what lessons we can draw in terms of actually coding an AI that can solve this class of puzzle. So when I say a sliding tile puzzle, what do I mean? Well, what I really mean, here's a uh, sliding tile puzzle from a uh, website, helpfulgames.com, has sliding tile puzzles. And I chose to look at the uh, four by four one. This is the fifth. This is the fifteen puzzle, which is probably the size that most people play with. You can make these puzzles of any size, but this is probably the most popular size for humans and for computer programs to play with. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But what's the puzzle here? Well, as you can see on the screen here, the numbers one through uh, fifteen are on these tiles and you're supposed to put them in order and if we get in this case it's got the cute side effect that if we get all the numbers in order we get a pretty picture that we can look at but what do i mean put them in order well you can't just drag them around all you can do is you can slide a tile that's why it's called a sliding tile puzzle into this blank space here and that tile slid into the blank space makes room for another tile and so i can start to reorganize things that way so if i want to get the one in the upper left hand corner for example I can get things out of the way for it like this and up we go into the one position and each time you see that a tile slides from you know slid into that blank space so that blank space is kind of an interesting part of the puzzle uh, it's worth thinking about You'll notice that, you might notice if you can see, although it's probably not easy to see on this screen, they also give you some hints if you wanna use them for sort of figuring out where pieces are supposed to go in the blank space, that's interesting. Um, Just now notice that. So anyway, I can then proceed to put number two in place and so forth, and uh, it's not so hard. Then I can go find three and put it up here. And you'll notice that so far, nothing very interesting has happened. Let's do it like this. This is actually kind of a cool trick sometimes. So we'll do this. And now one, two, and three are in place, but I still need to get number four in place. So let's do that next. They make these out of plastic um, and in the old days out of wood as actual physical puzzles you can solve. And they're kind of cool. They're kind of fun to play around with. They come in all different sizes and all different kinds. Uh, and I'll, I'm not going to go ahead and solve this whole one. Oh, maybe I will. Maybe I'll just go ahead and solve this one real fast because I think it's interesting at some point. So you'll notice that I've picked a particular strategy, right? I've picked the strategy of putting the pieces in place in order. And if you watch a human solve this, this is pretty inevitably what the human being is gonna do is to say, well, I'll just go from upper left to lower right and solve it that way. And, uh, and that's a perfectly legitimate solution strategy. Whoops. All right, I can do it now like this. Um, and Yet it's not the only choice, right? Nobody's making me do it like that. It's not like they have to be put in place in this particular order. It's just the order that human beings find convenient to understand and work with. So now we got the first two rows and now we need nine in place next. So let's rotate nine around to be in place. And then we want 10. And then we want 11, 
But now things get hard, right? Now the numbers are in the way of each other and it's not super hard, easy to see how to get them uncrowded. Oh, we got really lucky this time. In this situation, uh, it turns out that when we get 9, 10, 11, and 12 in place, 13, 14, and 15 fall in place, and there we go. I promise you it can get a lot harder than that. You can get in situations where things are kind of rearranged and you have to do some clever, more interesting things to do this. But that's the sliding tile puzzle. That's the idea. So cool. So that this is an interesting question, right? Um, does this... Uh, do these little sliding tile puzzles actually, uh, you know, is this intelligent? I would argue, yeah, in a very, very narrow way, right? This is very narrow domain specific intelligence. But of course, you know, the a fish will never solve one of these, right? Um, a dog will never solve one of these. Probably a monkey will never solve one of these. It's the kind of thing that, you know, is really going to take some level of humanish intelligence. And, you know, it's, so it makes it an interesting thing to think about. Well, the framework we're working with is the state space search framework, right? What's the state? Well, the state in this case is a particular configuration of the puzzle, right? This arrangement of tiles right here, including the blank, is one state of this game. And if I slide a tile, I get another state of the game, right? And in the general case, a state can have four four neighbors, right? What's the neighborhood? How do we make a state space out of this? Well, if you think of this state as a point in a state space graph, then the four neighbors are the ones I get by sliding one down, six over, 14 up, or four over. And so, you know, each state has between two and four neighbors, right? If it's in a corner, if the blank's in a corner, then there's only two neighbors. If the blank's along the side, there's three neighbors. That's a state space graph. And, you know, I, I, I borrowed this picture from an author, author's paper. I don't have the author's name handy, but you can ask me for it if you'd like. I do have it written down. But this is a nice, you know, picture of a tiny part of the state space graph for a 15 puzzle, right? Um, you know, if I'm in this situation, then I can travel down to this, for this state. I can travel down to this state. From here, I can travel over to this state. From here, I can travel back. I can travel up, right? Notice that these are. this is an undirected graph. I can always undo my moves, which is not a property every puzzle has, and it may be a useful possibility. And if you think about it, solving the 15 puzzle, you know, each one of these corresponds to a move. Each one of these edges corresponds to a move. What we really want to find is the same thing we wanted to find when we were talking about maps. We want to find a map from whatever state we start in to the state where the puzzle is solved, right? And you know we do that by making these transitions through the graph. And so we're going to be searching for a route, a path in a big old state space. Well, but how big a state space am I talking about? How many states? Well, it turns out that a good, uh, a, a, an easy calculation here um, says that for an n by n puzzle, there's sort of all the different ways you can arrange the tiles in order, right? Which is n factorial. Uh, this obeys Bart's iron law of of large numbers, which says when a number is large and you ask what the formula is, somebody will inevitably shout factorial, unless the answer is factorial, in which case they won't. But here it's pretty obvious, right? That the number of permutations of these tiles is n factorial, and that's all the states you can get, except it turns out there's a parity argument. If I, if I can only reach half the states from any given position, and a cruel trick you can play if you have one of these physical sliding tile puzzles is to just swap two adjacent puzzle things, pry out the pieces and swap them so that two adjacent pieces are swapped. It turns out if you do that, the puzzle is unsolvable. Um, but still, roughly speaking, you know, within a factor of two, we have uh, n squared factorial for an n by n puzzle. So how big is that? What, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, the two puzzle, uh, the two by two square, has uh, 24 states, um, 2.4 times 10 to the one. Uh, the three puzzle has uh, 
36,000 states, more or less. The four puzzle, the the 16 puzzle, the, one, the 15 puzzle, the one we were looking at. So this is side two, this is side three, this is side four. It turns out that there's, um, we've gone from, uh, sorry, 300,000 states, 24 to 300,000 to two times 10 to the 13th states for the four puzzle. Wow, what is two times 10 to the 13th? Well, you know, thousands, millions, billions, and now we're up to nine. Um, trillions is 12. So it's like 20 trillion states. Ouch, that's a lot of states. I will not be representing 20 trillion states in memory. I will not be searching them with a CPU. If I figure that I can search a billion states a second, with my fancy modern desktop, well, that's still uh, 20,000 seconds. How much is 20,000 seconds? Uh, it's, it's, it's a bunch. Um, nickel, 20,000 divided by 60 divided by 60 is five and a half hours, 5.6 hours. So I guess in principle, I can search all the states as long as I don't try to store them all at the same time and as long as I can search a billion a second. If I can only search 100 million a second, it's going to take 50 hours, which starts to sound pretty bad. But what I really want to do is cut that down. And then if I go up one more, oh, look at that. It goes from 13, 2 times 10 to the 13th to 1.55 times 10 to the 25th. Literally all the computers don't have enough storage or enough CPU to search a space completely of size 10 to the 25th. That's just a ridiculously large number. Um, that's 10 to the 12th computers, which is probably all the computers, you know, is going to take 55 hours to do. So, yeah. So that's why we call it combinatorial searches because the combinatorics get weird really fast. I'm just looking, searching in a graph, just like if I was trying to find a route in Google Maps, except the graph is the map of an unimaginably large map. It's just huge, but it's also really, really regular, right? It also, the rules that define it are not all that complicated. So maybe there's ways we can deal with it without having to search the whole thing. And in general, that's a good rule of thumb for state space search. You know, the kinds of questions you ask when you're trying to decide whether to solve a problem using state space search are how big is the space? In this case, for the 15 puzzle, we kind of feel like, well, it's right on the edge of manageable. It's probably okay. Um, do I need a best solution or just a good one? Well, what does that mean in terms of the sliding tile puzzle? You know, so far when we were solving these puzzles, we said, well, we'll take any solution, right? Um, you know, we're not trying to find, we're just, we'll take any old path that leads from the starting state to the goal, the state you're in right now to the goal state. So that's cool. But if you were in a hurry, right? You might want to find the fastest path, the shortest path, right? Because that'll give you the fastest solution. You might want to move as few tiles as possible to get to the uh, goal state. That's a different puzzle. That's a lot harder. Humans can't really solve that one at all. That's not really in the range of human capability. We can solve, as you saw, the problem of find a solution real easily, but a shortest solution? Ugh, suddenly the problem got a lot harder. For computers, it turns out it's not a lot harder. Am I willing to use heuristics? That is, am I willing to put some programming effort into solving this problem that is specific to just this problem? I mean, I can use very generic methods to try to solve this problem, or I can start to, you know, do some stuff based on heuristic guessing with that's tuned to sliding tile puzzles, or even this tuned to 15 puzzles. And that kind of heuristics can really help, but it does feel a little like cheating. Maybe the program isn't quite so smart if you have to sort of code the answer as we talked about last week. And do you need guarantees on the solution, on the solution quality, on the solution existence, right? Remember I said half of these aren't solvable, right? Well, how do you decide whether a particular one is solvable? It turns out there's a way to do that really fast using clever a clever parody trick but 
The obvious way to do it is to try to solve it. Well, what if it's not solvable? What if I gave you one of the ones that wasn't solvable? How will you ever know? It's an interesting question. So the dumbest possible thing you can sort of do is you can imagine, well, let's not do anything clever, right? Let's just start clicking on the puzzle, right? The computer can click really fast. You know, if I, if I model this puzzle in code, then this is really easy to do. Just every time pick a random neighbor and whatever neighbor you pick, you know, that's fine. Sometimes you're gonna go backwards because you pick the same random neighbor again. So maybe you don't wanna do that. But even if you don't pick the same one every time, you're gonna go in circles sometimes randomly and end up where you started. But I'm just going around, just clicking on stuff, right? Obviously for a human being, this is not a viable way to solve a 15 puzzle, right? There, you know, literally thousands of clicks isn't even gonna get you started probably if you're not paying any attention to what the numbers are. All you do is, oh, I happen to win, I, I can recognize that. That's gonna be a long night. But again, computers can probably do hundreds of millions of clicks a second. And at that point, for this size state space, Maybe I can just wait, to, wait and hope I get lucky, right? Maybe that's a viable strategy. And I've actually implemented that, among other things, in some code that's in our repository. I'm gonna look at that code um, with the class tomorrow, but for now, just take my word for it that this runs for a really long time on a 15 puzzle. It's actually pretty viable for the nine puzzle. If I go back to the, um, go back to the, uh, oh, change level that's what i want to do if i go back to the three by three puzzle the eight puzzle you know this one if i just click around randomly maybe eventually i get lucky and you know that's that you can imagine that a computer might get lucky pretty fast given you know you're trying hundreds of millions of things because there just aren't that many choices the state space is only 24 things so on average in something vaguely like 12 moves that isn't right, but on average in something va vaguely like, uh, I don't know, a few hundred moves anyway, I'm almost certain to uh, have just gotten lucky and solved the puzzle. We have a feeling we could do better. That doesn't sound like artificial intelligence. It doesn't sound like intelligence of any kind. The first thing I noticed is, like I say, you know, if you just really pick randomly, maybe you uh, repeat the same thing over and over, either directly or by going in circles or whatever. You know, there's no point in picking a move that gets you to a state you've already visited because you've already visited that state. You know, there, there was you already know a shorter way to get there, which is to do all the stuff you didn't get to it the first time. So we might wanna keep what's called a taboo list. And a taboo list is just let's or a stop list or a closed list. It's just a list that we keep a set. We call them a list, but they're really sets. But you know, that's how we that's how we roll sometimes. I keep the set of states I've already visited, and if I if my if my randomly chosen move is about to take me to one of those, I just don't. I'm like, oh, I've already seen that state go away. So I, if I go like this, then this is literally not an option. Now that leads to an interesting question. What if I do this? What if I do this and then, you know, through some sequence of moves, get to where there's no legal moves? Oh, that's a problem. So I need to think about that a little bit. But the other problem with it is what I said before, right? For the nine puzzle, fine. I can keep track of, uh, you know, what I guess it was 300,000 states for the nine puzzle. That's why I was confused earlier. For the 16 puzzle, it's not very convenient. It's a lot of memory to keep track of all those states. I'm gonna to want a really t small representation and I'm gonna to wanna to be really careful about it, right? By the way, what is a reasonable representation for this problem? Well, you got 15 tiles. So what you're looking for is a permutation of the numbers, uh, you know, one through 15 or zero to 14 if you prefer. So it sounds like uh, four bits per and so I have 16 times four is 64. Yeah, the blank's there too, so we'll make the blank be zero. So it's uh, sort of zero through 15 is four bits times 16 is 64 bits. Oh, numerology is always a cool thing in 
computer programming, right? 64 bits sounds like a really convenient number. That means I can fit the representation of one of these states in a register. That's nice. And that means I can do bit operations on it, which is nice. But on the other hand, it's still eight bytes per state, baby. And if you go back to our table here for the 15 puzzle, you know, it's not that we need um, two times 10 to the 13th states, it's that we need two times 10 to the 13th times eight bytes of memory. So 16 times 10 to the 13th bytes of memory. And what did we say? Um, that was a lot of terabytes of memory if I really want to keep the whole stop list. But hey, maybe I'll get lucky way earlier and won't have to use it all, who knows. Um, so this isn't a very viable plan. We probably aren't really going to do this. We're probably going to use what's called complete search. And what I mean by complete here is that the algorithm I just described, the random algorithm, what's the maximum running time of it? Well, forever. You're not guaranteed in any way to ever find a solution. You know, randomness is funny, and there's a very, very, very small probability that I could sit here for 100 hours just moving these two or three tiles around and never touch the tile with the, you know, with the three in it. That's not very satisfying. And it also means that the state space, you know, the, the, your stop list is sort of full of randomly chosen states, which isn't very convenient either. So maybe we want to find a solution that's sort of systematic-ish, one that we, where we sort of are always making forward progress in the sense that we're we're eliminating more and more things that might be part of a solution until we eliminate all the things. And maybe we even want a shortest solution. Maybe we're going to go ahead as long as we're being complete and say, let's 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 make a shortest solver. And what we want is if the solver runs long enough, which may be ridiculously long, we want to guarantee that it will say no if the problem is unsolvable. And that's what's called a complete search because it gives it always gives an answer. But of course, the amount of time and memory it takes may be ridiculous, so it's not any magic bullet for solving NP-hard problems. It's just the way you have to solve NP-hard problems systematically. And the obvious choices here are to do one of two things. You can either breadth first search the state space or you can depth first search the, search the state space, right? Um, in a breadth first search, which is what you probably want to do if you're going to find shortest paths, let's say this is your starting state, right? I'm gonna look at all four of these neighbors and see if any of them are a solution. If they aren't, then I'm gonna look at the neighbors of this one and see if any of them are a solution. And then, you know, the neighbors of this one and the neighbors of this one and the neighbors of this one and see if there, any of them are a solution. And I'm gonna keep expanding like that until I find a solution. Well, there again, memory is a problem. And if I do it just the way I described, then we know the size of the frontier, which is what governs the space requirements of depth first search, is going to grow exponentially, and we're going to be out of, at least, and we're going to be out of luck very fast in terms of running out of memory. But maybe that day will never come. Because remember, we're finding shortest solutions. And so if there is a short solution, sort of what's the longest solution we could have? Oh, probably only, you know, sort of 65 moves, maybe. Um, let's assume just arbitrarily the largest solution we could have is 32 moves. You know, the, the worst case from start to end is 32 moves, which is probably about right. I think you could make that argument, actually. And let's say that on average, there's three choices from each state, uh, three neighbors of each state, then the sort of number of possible states you get out of that argument is three to the 64th. Um, which is 10 to the 30th. Oh, that's worse. That's a worse bound than the bound we got before. Oh, that's interesting. So that tells you that you're, there's gonna be a lot of duplicate states if we just do this in the dumbest possible way. But let's say that it's not so bad. Let's say that um, it's only um, 16 moves from our thing to our, you know, from our starting place to our goal. Oh, now you only have to search about a million states, some somewhere between, no, sorry, 10 or, 10 or 15 million states is enough. 
well 50 50 million states 15 million states those are not big numbers right computers don't care about 50 million it doesn't matter to them so if the shortest path happens to be short in your particular problem then we can do breadth research because we have enough memory and we have enough time to actually store all the states and to actually search all the states until we get to a, shor a shortest path to a goal and oh and we get a bonus it's a shortest path what if we uh don't want to use so much memory well then another approach is to use depth first search and in a depth first search I might want to go from this starting state, pick one of these, pick one of its children, and so forth, right? And if I ever get stuck, I backtrack like you do with depth first search. Well, what does stuck here mean? Oh, it means that all the neighbors of the state I'm looking at are places I've already been. Then I can back out. Well, if you just do that blindly, it's not space efficient at all, because essentially you end up doing a random walk through the space the space of possible moves that doesn't sound good um and so we're gonna have to find some clever tricks if we want to make depth first search work but why would i want depth first search work why would i want depth first search because the amount of memory used during a depth first search is proportional to the depth right which means that it's logarithmic in the number of states that means that if i if the if the maximum solution really is 64 states away oh my depth first search only needs something like 30 memories i mean it should be base 2 instead of base 10 in this case probably or base 3 or something anyway it's not so bad right you know, very small memory for depth first search. And that's why we do it instead of breadth first search, but we're gonna have to find some tricks to make that work. So that's an introduction to sliding tile puzzles. And what I want you to think about as we stop here is sort of, yeah, what we're finding out is that sort of with better and better algorithms, you start to be able to uh, track down solutions pretty quickly right um you, you start to feel like oh yeah this program really is being smart about how it looks um for three the the nine puzzle by the way is really easy um but let's solve one anyway just while we're clicking around and so you know this is interesting from our from an artificial intelligence point of view but oh i see i i lost track um i only need to do this and then I want to get the four in place, and that'll be interesting. Nope. And this is where it gets interesting sometimes is, um, I really want to get out of the way, right? There's the four in place. And now I do a rotation, right? Five, six, seven, eight, and there we go. So the point is that as we get toward the end, we get more constrained and that search actually gets harder. And uh, <laughs> yeah, exciting. I, I really don't care about this puzzle except as an AI instance. And so, you know, we're starting to do some AI. And it isn't like the AI you've read about. It isn't like the AI you've heard about. It's not all full of machine learning and clever inference and stuff. This machine doesn't learn anything. And every time I prop, plop a new puzzle in front of it, it figures out from scratch what's going on. But still, it acts smart. And to some extent, one of the morals of this course is gonna be if it acts smart, it is smart. That's what I have you for you today. Uh, again, please stay safe and well in this difficult time. Thank you much for listening and I look forward to talking to you again soon.